Thank you for the honor of, of being here. I'm a big fan of RICO. I think I've watched all of the videos online. I've used them in my teaching, so it's a, it's a huge honor to be here. I'd like to quickly start just thanking SCA for this opportunity. I'd also like to say a special thanks to uh, Ted Lingle. Uh, Ted's a mentor of mine, and he provided uh, a pathway for somebody like me that 20 plus years ago got into coffee because they loved, loved coffee. And you know, two decades later, here I am having the opportunity to share some of that journey uh, with you. I'd also like to thank the, all the students that I've taught over the years. I've you know, learned a lot more from them than I could ever teach them, especially the Q Processing Level 3 students and the Processing Cohort. Uh, the, the knowledge that you all share with me, the friendships, the camaraderie is a, is a highlight of my life, so, so thank you. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about the role of post-harvest processing in creating a new specialty coffee paradigm. And I put forth in here the following argument, that post-harvest processing can aggregate value across the supply chain, and it can do this by bringing new flavors to coffee, and it can improve the lives of coffee growers, and it can do this by bringing respect to a profession that has historically lacked it. How can it do this? We're talking here, at Enrico, about a paradigm shift within specialty coffee. There's also this paradigm shift within coffee processing. Um, and looking at the history of science and scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn said, the answers you get depend on the questions you ask. He was largely talking about those questions being defined by this new paradigm. But I think it behooves us to ask, what, are, what is our current paradigm? What are some things that we want to shake that we don't want? And what does this new paradigm look like? And what are some things that we would like to bring to have a better industry and potentially a better world? So on that note, and looking at things that we might want to shake, I'd like to start with an, with an anecdote. Uh, I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa. As Bill Bryson wrote, somebody had to. Um, and I remember when I was 10 years old, we got into our blue station wagon and we were going to the Meskwaki Reservation. And for the first time in my life, I was gonna be among Native Americans and I was excited. I was gonna see them living in teepees and wearing buckskin and riding in horses and shooting their bows and arrows at buffaloes. And I couldn't believe it, I couldn't wait to get there. And when I got there, what I found were Iowans. And Iowans are pretty average people, that's why we vote first in the, in the nation. Um, and I was upset, a little bit maybe darker complexion, a little bit darker hair, but Iowans just like me. And I thought to myself, you can't do that. You can't be Iowans, you, you're Native Americans. You need to live like Native Americans. Needless to say that Tama was pretty tame, and I went home disappointed. And it took me many years to sort of process what, what was my expectation. And my expectation was really that I expected some people to live a life of basically penury so that I could have what I've come to call a rustic tie to the land. And I found comfort in that. Fast forward 20 years, and it's August, a hot August day in Austin, Texas, and I'm at a coffee shop in Austin, Texas, fortunately well air conditioned, uh, waiting in line next to a beautiful souped up espresso machine and being sold the micro lot. And the micro lot that I was being sold, you've got to try this micro lot. It was hand picked on the steep slopes, only selective harvest, only the ripest of cherries on the slopes of the Andean mountains. It's a wonderful coffee. And I thought, ah, there it is again, this rustic tie to the land. I'm being sold a rustic tie to the land. This expectation and this enjoyment at some level that people are living lives of penury and that provides comfort. And I think we've done a good job to shake this at large in the coffee industry, but I would argue that it still prevails. It prevails in the images that we put on our walls, our social walls, our mortar walls. It even prevails in the hues a lot of times and the colors that we choose in our, in our packaging, in our jute bags, et cetera. And we need to examine this if we're gonna shake something and move into another paradigm. Another that we can consider is that great coffee is discovered, the coffee hunter. That coffee needs to be discovered, that we need somebody to go and discover these great coffees. And this assumes a couple of things. It assumes that the people that are growing the coffee can't identify it themselves. They don't have the knowledge. They can't say that it's good. Or maybe it assumes that it's not good until the coffee hunter says it's good. Uh, to borrow from Socrates and Euthyphro talking about the gods, is coffee good? because the coffee hunt, it, it's independently good, and the coffee hunter goes there and says, ah, this is good, I, 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 this is good. Or, is nothing good until the coffee hunter goes and says, this is good, and then it becomes good, and anointed good. So this is another trope that we seem to have. Again, we've tried to shake it, but I know that the media loves to take this. It's engaging for consumers, and we need to be careful of shaking this uh, as we move into the next, uh, the new paradigm. 
And speaking of Socrates, we have this mentality that the coffee origins need the West. They need our knowledge. They need us in order to make great coffee. You know, for centuries, we've asked coffee origins, produce a flavorful coffee and do it cheaply. And by God, they've succeeded. All of us are here because we love coffee and because of the work, the work of scientists like Jaime Castillo, like Flavio Borain, like Arcegis Carvalho, institutions like the IAC, like Cinecafe, an incredible institution, Icafe, Anacafe, Sirhaj, so many institutions have contributed and we are here because of their work, so we need to be very careful. Yes, it is true that the institutions, the Western institutions and Western budgets can improve coffee, definitely, I'm not arguing, that would be stupid to argue against that. But we need to be careful and that we present that all knowledge and goodness comes from the, the West, especially at an individual level. And I know that I'm very hoist with my own petard when I say this, but is it the base of knowledge a lot of times that prevails, or is it the, the, the width and the breadth and the altitude of the platform that people are given? Let me give you an example. If a coffee roaster in San Francisco publishes an article about coffee processing on their blog, within seconds, minutes, hours, that has permeated coffee communities across the globe. If a coffee grower in Sumatra who's been processing coffee for 20 years, and it's really hard to process good coffee in Sumatra, if they publish an article about coffee processing on their blog, and let's even set aside the, the, the concept or the, 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 the linguistic uh, hegemony and assume that they publish it in English. That information doesn't flow so much in the opposite direction. And this just reinforces that concept. And it doesn't provide the platform to people that a lot of times are the ones that have the solutions. So another thing that we need to think about as we move into a new paradigm. Okay, so I'm here to talk about processing. We've always had coffee processing, Joel. What has changed? in coffee processing. We've had a paradigm shift in coffee processing. For most of the history of coffee, the mantra, if you will, was look, don't mess it up. Just preserve what's, what, what happened on the tree with the environment. Don't generate any defects, pick some out, and give me this coffee. That's what we've asked for, and that's been the paradigm. But we've now shifted to a paradigm where it's not just physical actions, but we're asking growers to use their heads, and they're doing so exceptionally well. A great example of this is with Flavia and Luis Saldana from Fazenda, California and Paraná, Brazil. They, at 800 meters and south of the Tropic of Capricorn, are producing some of the world's best coffees consistently. How are they doing it? They're doing it through an explor exploration of their terroir, different genetics and of post-harvest processing, using different microorganisms, using commercial microorganisms, cultivating some on their farm, and they're able to produce a portfolio of flavor profiles. And this is the new paradigm that we see. Yeah, but Joel, that's an exception. Louise is an exception. But I ask you, can we take this exception of what some growers are doing and make that outlier the new reality? And I think we can. And I think that that's our mission to do that. Historian Lynn White says, a new device merely opens a door. It does not compel one to enter. So what are the tools that we can have to walk through that door? And what is the reality that we want to see on the other side of that door. I propose that we think about three things. There's obviously quite a few, but one is order from chaos. Two is what will the rules of this new game be? And three is the issue of respect that I've talked about a little already. So order from chaos. It's confusing. We have all of these processing styles. We have all of these new flavors. Can we organize these in a way that from grower to end consumer aggregate value across the supply chain? What does that organization look like? In coffee, the beauty and complexity of coffee is that we have so many factors that can impact quality. The genetics, the origin, the coffee grower, the processing, the roast level, the blending, all of these can impact quality. Is there a hierarchy that we can all get behind? Pun intended, it, you know, I'm not saying it comes top down, but maybe we can coalesce around a certain hierarchy. What does that look like so that we can present that across the supply chain? Is it the farm model, where the highest thing is the farm? Is it the grower, where we have the grower and all the information follows below the grower? Do we follow wine, where it's ultimately an exploration of the genetics and the terroir? And then that is what defines what the hierarchy is. Or maybe we think outside of the box with something totally different. Maybe we can look to beer for an example. 
We can look at styles. Beer has different styles of beer. Can we have different styles of coffee? Can we take all of these flavors that we're getting from post-harvest processing and start to categorize them in styles? And will that in, uh, make its way across the supply chain and encourage consumers to, to develop more passion for coffee and spend more money on, on coffee and aggregate value across the supply chain? We can produce acetic sours. We can produce dark chocolatey. We can produce red fruit bombs. Can those become styles of coffee? It's worked for the beer industry. 10, 15 years ago, if you walked into a supermarket, you had very few brands, cutthroat pricing, and not much interest. You went to get beer, and maybe you had your brand. But now when you walk to the beer aisle, you have an, an opportunity to explore beer. And this has ag aggregated immense uh, value to the beer industry. Can we do something similar in coffee? And how does that affect coffee evaluation? Right now, we have a system where there's basically one standard. Right? Coffee is good or bad, it receives a high score or a low, low score. The coffee that wins the competition is oftentimes the most exotic coffee. Can we instead start looking at evaluation within styles, like beer or like dogs? Right? If you look at a dog competition, you have a chihuahua competing against the Great Dane. And you're like, how does a chihuahua compete against a Great Dane? Well, it's because the chihuahua can beat the Great Dane. If the chihuahua is more chihuahua, then the Great Dane is Great Dane. And it sounds a little silly, but I would argue that a lot of our uh, coffee competitions, the winners, are coffees that most of our consumers would never want to drink. Can we encourage more interest in our industry if we start to talk about styles and success within different styles of coffee, similar to what the beer industry has done? And I'm here to talk about processing, so how, what role does processing play in this? Ironically, as someone who has dedicated their entire life to processing, uh, I don't know how big of a role, how much of the uh, forefront processing should take. And I have two reasons why. One is because I think it's a step in a complex step removed from flavor. I think what consumers and most people want is to talk about flavors of coffee. Uh, I don't know how many uh, days or hours I've spent on processing consultations where my focus has been on turning the mucilage black because they want to sell a black honey, because they'll get more money, and rightfully so. They'll probably get more money if that mucilage is black. But is that what's really important? Or is it more important, is the better question to ask, what flavors are we trying, or precursors, are we trying to put into the bean? That seems to be a more interesting and a better question. And I also think we need to be careful to limit processing right now. We're in this age where we have so much innovation for processing. If we start to say that you need to do A, B, and C for a certain a style or a certain type of coffee, we might limit grower innovation, which is producing great results, and I'm sure we'll continue to. All right, so what are the rules of the game? New paradigm means new rules. What are some of the rules uh, for this new paradigm? One of the big rules is what are the rules for quality? How are we defining quality? Is quality purity, going back to the wine scenario, is it the highest form, the highest level of coffee, is the preservation of the plant and the environment, that interaction? and anything else are processing flavors and we want to mitigate that, mitigate human intervention. Is that what the terroir, the search for terroir, or do we allow the human to go into the terroir? And as the human can use in the post-harvest processing, as I gave the example of Flavia and Louise, they can manipulate factors, the oxygen levels, the temperature, so many different things in the post-harvest processing, and it's not just a purity argument, it's look, with our terroir, we have these five distinct flavors that we can produce, or, or whatever. Right. Is that the ultimate? Is that what we're looking for? Is that what quality is? And can we add things to coffee? Is that off limits or not? Can we add commercial yeast to coffee? Is that empowering? Does that allow a grower to consistently achieve the same profile? If they add yeast X, they get flavor Y, they can do that every year, and they're a more valuable partner that way. Or is that introducing foreign microorganisms? Do we need to cultivate that locally? Sometimes called microorganismos de montaña. Should we go out and cultivate local molds and bacteria? And that even adds more to the terroir of the farm. And if we're adding things, can we add fruits? Can we add cinnamon? Can we add something that has massive transformational power, like a fruit, throw papaya in there, even though if the final coffee doesn't taste like papaya, it impacts the flavor. Or if we're seeking if, if X, then Y, why not just add Y? If I know that cinnamon is going to prevail throughout, why don't, and I want cinnamon, why not just add cinnamon? Right? What's wrong about that? Is that accepted? You know, I don't have the, the answers, none of us do, but we need to have these conversations and ask, ask these questions as we move into the, the new paradigm. What do we need to know in terms of transparency? 
What do we need to know? Do we need to know what the growers are doing? Do we need to know all these things that they're adding to the coffee? Well, I think legally, the question will solve itself. We have standards out there. We have international and national. It's not such a complex question as the other one is, which is the ethical argument. Ethically, what do growers need to tell us? Do they need to tell us that they're putting cinnamon? Do they need to tell us that they're doing papaya? What's the difference between papaya and yeast? They're both external things. Where do we draw those lines and what can and can't be done? And I don't have the answers for this, but I do have a, want to say one thing we need to be careful about. Are we, are we setting the rules for the right reasons? Are we setting the rules because we feel comfortable with the power structure that we've always had at some level? Uh, is that the reason that we're setting the rules? Why do we need to know? Are we setting the rules so that we have transparency and that we can aggregate more value across the supply chain? You know, saying that something is ethical implies some sign of a, kind of a social contract. In an industry where you've had uh, oppressed populations and cycles of poverty, it seems a little bit uh, much for, for a coffee buyer to say to a grower that you need to adhere to some kind of ethical contract. So we need to tread lightly and have a justifiable reason of how this aggregates value if we're going to start imposing these rules. And that leads me to my final point, which is respect. And I think that post-harvest processing and that revolution that is happening there provides a huge window of opportunity for us to bring respect to a profession that has largely lacked it. How can we do that? Well, the first is we need to tell a different narrative. We need to tell a narrative so that when the coffee buyer in a coffee shop in Copenhagen goes to buy the cup of coffee, they're not buying that coffee because they feel sorry for the grower. They're buying that cup of coffee because they want to be the coffee grower. That's the narrative that we need to start telling in our industry. You know, Joel, you're thinking too big. It's not just about coffee. That's about larger issues of race and culture, urban, rural, developed versus undeveloped world. But I would argue that in coffee, we have one hell of a platform in order to tell that story. We have coffee shops on every uh, corner. We have coffees in, the, in every house. Coffee is a daily part of so many people's lives. If we don't have the platform, then who does? So what do we tell? We need to tell the story about growers using their heads and generating flavors. And the flavor that you like in the coffee came from that grower because they made decisions in the post-harvest. And start to tell that narrative and focus on that. And maybe, you know, you can say, well, it's not all that way, Joel. You're, kind of, you're, you're asking us to shine the light on just a few, on a minority, and avoid what's really going on. And in some ways, yes, I am. But I argue that by shining the light there, you're going to attract a lot more people into that form, to, to viewing post-harvest processing uh, as growers using their, their heads. I would also argue, and I know that I, this happened, happens for me, that I was accorded a lot of space to fake it until I made it. And I think probably you know, many of you might feel the same way. And I know a lot of the founders of our specialty coffee industry were accorded that space. Let's accord a little bit of space to coffee growers in that aspect as well. Also, we need to start telling a story about technology. Look, let's not tell the story about being on the Andean slopes and selectively harvesting. That's not a good story for us to tell. You know, let's not tell the story about buckskin and bows and arrows. Let's start telling the story about how growers can use technology to improve the product. Why not? Why can't they use color sorters? Why can't they use drones? You know, a lot of what's going on in Brazil, the mechanical harvesting, that's a great thing. That is aggregating massive value to our industry. Brazilians are producing incredible coffees using those big machines, using drones, using technologies. That's not a bad thing, that's a great thing. And we need to start incorporating the use of technology into the narratives that we tell. And similarly, what, we need to start supporting homegrown technologies. I remember when growing up in Iowa, when I went to Iowa State University, you would see the, the, the sponsorship and the involvement of private industry at the university. Pioneer, John Deere, uh, uh, endowed chairs, all of those things that you would see, centers for innovation. When I travel in, at Origin, I don't see those. Maybe they're there and I just don't see them, but we need to start thinking along those lines. I know that there's a lot of issues, that there's not a precedent, the issues of corruption, but we need to start thinking about how can we support local academic institutions to create more homegrown talent and more homegrown technologies. And what platforms can we provide? Of course, I, I gave the example before about the barista or the roaster in San Francisco and how that makes its way across the globe. Of course the logarithms are racist and culturalist because we are as a society. So they're just mirroring what, who we are. How can we provide platforms and use coffee uh, to start going against that flow? Look, we're in an industry that's made rock stars of roasters and baristas. 
Why can we not make rock stars, more rock stars, of coffee growers and coffee processors? That should be an objective that we, we have. Now, there's companies out there that are doing a great job of this already. Era of We, Olam, Sukafina, and many others have provided those, some platforms, and we need to continue to do that. And I'd like to end with a, a, a hypothetical scenario, a look of what that paradigm might be like that we move through uh, if we use the tool of post-harvest processing. So let's assume that you just made a million dollars. You bought a Bitcoin for a dollar yesterday. You sold it today for a million. Apparently that can happen. Uh, and you want to go out for a nice meal. You like Japanese. Your significant other likes Peruvian. So no booze, right? Japanese Peruvian uh, fusion, master of his craft. Nobody knows uh, that better than Nobu. While you're waiting to have your meal, you want to have a whiskey, a scotch, and not just any scotch a scotch crafted by Jim McEwen. Nobody's gonna to go to Scotland and tell Jim McEwen how to distill. He's the master of his craft. While you're having your meal, you want to have a glass of wine, not just any wine. You want to have a wine crafted by Michel Hollande, one of the finest winemakers in the world. And the coffee, and the coffee, the last thing you're going to drink. We have Annabella Menezes from Santa Felisa. Can we get to a point as an industry and as a society, if like we can conjure up visions of grandeur, and a society of whole, whole where nothing smacks wrong about this. Annabella is a cup of excellence winner. She's doing incredible work, beautiful coffees. She definitely deserves to be there. But I think, it, it, can we get to a new paradigm uh, where, where Annabella, without any uh, uh, difficulty, is recognized as in being among that group? She definitely deserves it. So, that's all I have to say. Uh, <laughs> and thank you so much for, for taking the time. And hopefully you've, you agree or have bought in a little bit that post-harvest processing can serve to better uh, our industry in several ways. Thank you.